Hi, so I'm Rebecca Redman. I am, gosh, we consider ourselves now the teenage faculty in the Hemonk division. I'm no longer one of the most junior people, but I also don't consider myself to be senior by any means. Um, but I do both GI cancers and, and head and neck cancers. Um, so I've been tasked with the challenge of trying to give you an overview of GI cancers in about 45 minutes. So I sometimes tend to talk a little fast, so slow me down, um, and feel free to ask questions as we go along. Again, the focus of this really is to try to help you as internists or as subspecialists know how to work up um, cancers of the GI tract, talk a little bit about recognizing what, when are we treating something with curative intent and when we are we doing palliative treatment, and then also to talk a little bit about that treatment. So again, these are the learning objectives. I don't have any disclosures. And I'm going to start with colon cancer and probably spend a disproportionate amount of this talk on colon cancer. And the reason for that is about 1 in 20 people will be diagnosed with colon cancer over their lifetime. And so no matter what specialty you go into, you are going to take care of patients with colon cancer. And so I think the workup and the management of these patients is, is very important. So this is a case. Um, this is an actual case, a 33-year-old gentleman who presented to the ER with abdominal pain, diarrhea, and a 40-pound weight loss. This is his CT scan in the ER, um, and given concern for obstruction, he was admitted for workup. He had a colonoscopy, which revealed an obstructing necrotic mass at the hepatic flexure, and biopsies revealed moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma. So... What next? So a pre-op CEA was 67.9. He had a contrasted CT of the abdomen and pelvis. I will say we generally do all the way up through the chest. Depending on the guidelines you look at, some say that a chest X-ray is still adequate, provided there are no liver metastases. Um, nowadays, we tend to do a chest CT as well. So there's no evidence of metastatic disease, so he went to surgery and had a hemicolectomy, um, which revealed the tumor invading into the muscularis propria, so that's the muscular layer, um, with three of 99 involved lymph nodes. So that was a pretty ambitious pathologist to go through and dissect out 99 lymph nodes. We very rarely see that many. So colorectal cancer staging is important, and it's actually fairly straightforward. So stage one is a very early superficial, you could say, tumor. So it invades into the submucosa, and, and it can even involve into the thick muscular layers, but not through them. So that would be a T1 or a T2 Negative nodes, and how do we define negative nodes? Well, zero lymph nodes that they see. Ideally, they look for at least 12 lymph nodes. And so if you have less than 12 lymph nodes, that's a sign you go back to your pathologist and say, hey, can you pull that specimen again and try to dissect out a few more? Stage two is when it dives a little bit deeper into the wall of the colon, um, into the subserosa and the serosa. And then, of course, uh, stage three is if it's node positive, and that can be one out of 99 lymph nodes. There's no quantification as to once you have one lymph node, that automatically bumps you up to stage three. And then stage four, of course, is distant metastasis. So how do we treat resected colon cancer? And, and I should say I kind of define the term adjuvant. Um, so adjuvant treatment is something we generally give after someone has had surgery or their definitive treatment for their cancer in hopes of preventing or delaying a recurrence. So stage one, that's the T1, T2, N0, that is generally a surgeon's disease. I don't usually see those folks. They are mostly cured with surgery. There is a very low risk, certainly less than 10%, maybe, maybe even less than 5% risk of recurrence. Um, stage two is a little different. Their risk of recurrence is higher, somewhere on the order of about 20 25%. Um, and the role of chemotherapy in that setting is controversial. So I, I do usually see those folks. Not everyone gets chemotherapy, but we at least have that discussion. And this is uh, a depiction why. So this is the Quasar study. The majority of these patients were stage 2 colon cancer patients. Um, and you can see this is survival. So this is how many people or what percentage of people were alive, and this is years out from when they started the clinical trial. And you can see those who didn't get chemotherapy, who just had surgery and then were observed, had somewhere at around five years had about a 20 to 25 percent risk of dying. Presumably the majority of those deaths were related to their cancer. You can see the difference um, in those curves is small, but it's there. And when you look at eight years out from treatment, there's about a 3.5 to 4 percent difference in terms of the number of people who are alive. 
So when you look at that, unfortunately, it kind of gets really darn close to that confidence interval of one. Um, and that's, uh, that's been a theme through most of the adjuvant studies that have looked at stage two disease. There is always this small difference, um, and that's consistently somewhere between three and five percent, but not ever really statistically significant in terms of improving the likelihood that someone is alive five or even ten years later. So again, the recurrence risk is 20 to 25 percent. Um, most studies would suggest that there is a real benefit to doing chemotherapy and lowering the risk of recurrence, but no study's ever been shown um, to show a statistically significant improvement in survival. So how do we hedge our bet? There's probably a select group of patients that really do benefit from chemo, and then others who clearly don't need it. And so how can you kind of try to tease out who would and wouldn't? So the high-risk patients we define as very poorly differentiated tumors, um, lymphovascular invasion, those who present with obstruction, um, who have less than 12 lymph nodes dissected. You know, we worry, are we missing? You can see this gentleman had three out of 99 lymph nodes. Well, had they stopped at 12, it may have been zero. Um, perineural invasion, positive margins, obviously, or a perforated tumor. Um, I'm going to come back to this. So I, I specifically would say we would not treat um, a stage 2 patient who has a microsatellite unstable tumor, and we'll talk with that about that in a little bit. Um, and then most importantly, discuss the pros and cons with the patient. You know, is this somebody who wants to be really aggressive and, and is willing to go through six months of chemotherapy to, to get that small but real benefit, or do we look at it on the other side and say your chance of cure is high um, and just move on to active surveillance? So stage three is also curable, and this is a question that, that you probably will get on your boards. You know, the question is with a stage three patient who has surgery, who's otherwise fairly healthy, um, where do you refer them to next? And, and it should be to medical oncology for chemotherapy. So adjuvant chemotherapy for six months is the standard of care for someone with a resected stage three colon cancer. And that's a pretty, um, like I said, that's, that's a, a free one on the boards generally. Um, so this is a study that looked at just 5-FU alone. So 5-fluorouracil is a drug that's been around a very long time, um, and this was a study basically that randomized patients after surgery to observation or 5-FU-based chemotherapy. And you can see when you look at the patients free of recurrence, um, in general the risk of recurrence if you lump all stage 3 patients together. Now stage 3 colon cancer is a very heterogeneous population of patients. You have someone with 1 out of 90 lymph nodes and somebody with 13 out of 13 lymph nodes. The risk of recurrence can range anywhere from 30 to 80 percent. Um, but if you average that all out, all comers, it's about 50 percent. So when someone, I see someone with stage 3 colon cancer in the office, you can generally safely say your risk of recurrence is 50-50. And so the hope is with chemotherapy, you lower that risk of recurrence. With 5-FU alone, your relative risk reduction is approximately 30%. So 30% of 50%, basically. So you lower the risk of recurrence from about 50% down to about 35% or so, and that's with six months of 5 fluorouracil. What would be the standard of care today for most relatively fit patients would be something we call full FOX. And what that is is the 5-FE with the addition of oxaliplatin. And what I want to show you from these curves, this is the Mosaic study. Um, this included both stage 2 and stage 3 patients. So these top curves, these are the stage 2 patients. And you can see whether they got 5-FU by itself or 5-FU with oxaliplatin, they are virtually inseparable. And it's probably because the benefit of chemotherapy is so small to begin with, there's very little, if any, additional benefit to adding oxaliplatin in someone who has a relatively low risk of recurrence to begin with. When you look at the stage 3 patients, which is the gray and the red curve, you can see they separate by about 4% um, at six years out from treatment. So there is a real benefit to adding oxaliplatin, again, a small benefit. So again, a 4% absolute survival benefit at six years, but it's there. And so for a fit, young, healthy patient um, with stage 3 colon cancer that's been resected, the standard of care would be six months of adjuvant full FOX chemotherapy. There is a benefit to 5-FU alone, and the oxaliplatin does add quite a bit of toxicity in terms of myelosuppression and, and nausea and vomiting and neurotoxicity, peripheral neuropathy. So when someone you worry might not be able to tolerate that, single-agent 5-FU is a very reasonable option and, and certainly superior to just observation. So it doesn't have to be full FOX or nothing. Um, single-agent 5-FU is, is also a very active and appropriate agent for the elderly, for example.
So going back to our case, so this gentleman, he was young, in his 30s, got 12 cycles or six months of adjuvant full Fox chemotherapy, and he underwent microsatellite instability testing of his tumor. And I'm just going to spend a minute on this because it's hard to talk about colon cancer without talking about a couple of um, hereditary cancer syndromes. So he had an absence of MSH2, which is a DNA mismatch repair protein, um, which is essentially synonymous with the diagnosis of Lynch syndrome, or hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. His family members were urged to undergo testing. He will need, as, as being diagnosed with Lynch syndrome, an annual colonoscopy. So that's different than most recommendations we would have for someone with colon cancer. Um, an endometrial biopsy in women. They need periodic, which is not very well defined, depending on the guidelines you look at, upper endoscopy, as they're also at risk of upper GI tract cancers, and then urine cytology. So colon cancer can be very grossly separated into two groups. The most common is the chromosomal instability, um, and then 15% or so are microsatellite instability. And these are the people who actually have fairly normal-looking chromosomes in their tumor. They have very subtle changes, frame shift mutations that cause early truncation of proteins, for example. Um, actually, only about a third of those micro in microsatellite instable tumors are actually Lynch syndrome. The other two-thirds are just sporadic. You have silencing of one of the DNA mismatch repair um, promoters, the MLH1 promoter, by um, basically hypermethylation of the promoter silences expression of that. Um, and as a result of that, you get microsatellite instability in that tumor. That's not genetic um, in the sense that that is not passed on to their children, and so their children are not at any higher risk than someone else's who has colon cancer's children. Who do you screen for? Most guidelines nowadays tell us we should probably be doing microsatellite instability um, screening, if you will, on all newly diagnosed colon cancer patients. And that is usually done by immunohistochemistry. You just look for evidence of the protein by immunostains, um, and the four proteins are MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2. Um, you will sometimes see a pathology report that says, are there features of microsatellite instability, yes or no? And all that means is that the pathologist looks at it under the microscope and does it, is it really poorly differentiated? Does it have a lot of peritumoral lymphocytes? Those are all pathologic or histologic signs that perhaps this is a microcellulite unstable tumor, but that is in and of itself not diagnostic. What you really need to do is stain for the actual proteins. You can also send off PCR. Um, but either way, more and more people are doing that routinely. At a minimum, we follow the revised Bethesda guidelines, which are here. So anybody under the age of 50, um, anyone with either synchronous or metachronous HNPCC-associated tumors. So again, it can be an upper GI tract and a colon cancer. But if you've had two of those cancers in your lifetime, you should be screened. Um, someone with that MSI-like histology and patient under than six, or younger than 60, um, someone with a first-degree relative with an HNPCC-related tumor, um, and then again in a patient with two or more first- or second-degree, regardless of their age. Um, so these are pretty inclusive. The, um, they're fairly sensitive for picking up most cases, not all, um, but of course there are many patients who will fall into these guidelines and, and have microsatellite-stable tumors. And then just finally, one slide on FAP, um, again, accounts for less than 1% of colon cancers. This is not a subtle diagnosis, so you can see there is a carpet of polyps um, throughout that colon. Greater than 90% of patients will develop colon cancer by their 40s if they have not had a total proctocolectomy. And so the majority of these patients, as long as that they know of their family history, um, will have undergone a colectomy, usually sometime in their 20s. The timing of that is somewhat controversial. Um, it, it's difficult. You, you could argue the sooner the better, but um, in adolescence is a difficult time to go through a surgery like that and have a, um, a stoma and all of the other psychological um, things that accompany that in a, in a teenager or an adolescent. So oftentimes it's done in, in their early 20s. Um, the one thing to know is it's the APC gene that is mutated. Um, and you can get attenuated versions where there's um, perhaps less polyps, usually greater than 100 is still required to, to really meet that definition, but a later age of onset. Okay, so I'm going to transition really quickly to rectal cancer. And we treat colon cancer and rectal cancer very similarly with one exception that we'll talk about. 
So this is a patient who comes to the ER with four days of constipation, increasing distension, abdominal pain, and this is their CT in the ER. And you can see there's this big rectal mass. There's no obvious metastatic disease on their scans. So again, if this was a colon cancer, their CTs were negative, they'd go to surgery, right? Well, rectal cancer is a little bit different. So how do we define what's the rectum and what's the colon? And it's generally 12 to 15 centimeters, the distal aspect of the large intestine. So in somebody, your, your rectum does actually vary in size based on your height. So short people have shorter rectums, taller people have longer rectums. And so the actual measurement um, is probably less important than where it's located anatomically. And that's above or below the peritoneal reflection is really the anatomic definition. So where colon cancer is staged pathologically, you go to surgery, you have the um, pathologist tell you what stage it is, and then you determine their therapy. Rectal cancer is different. Um, they really need to be staged clinically and then also radiographically to help guide us on whether or not they need preoperative therapy. Okay, so he had an endorectal ultrasound and a pelvic MRI, actually. Um, but you can see the tumor looks as if it's invading the mesorectal fat, um, and there was one hyper-enhancing perirectal lymph node nearby that was suspicious. So they clinically staged him as a T3N1. So what's the ideal treatment for this patient? So surgery alone. Um, and, and from what we've talked about already, you should probably know the answer to that is no, right? So anybody who has node-positive disease is probably going to need chemotherapy um, as part of their treatment. Surgery and chemotherapy, maybe, reasonable. Um, surgery and radiation, or all three. And in reality, the answer is D. It's going to be all three. So patients with node negative, so had he had no visible lymph nodes, a T1 or a T2 tumor, they can usually get away with surgery alone, presuming that they have a true oncologic resection and generally don't need any adjuvant therapy. Once you get into T3 or T4 disease, even if node negative, their risk of recurrence goes up significantly. And it's because operating in the pelvis is much more technically difficult than doing a hemicolectomy, for example, in terms of the risk of recurrence is higher. Um, so because of that, usually patients with T3 or T4 disease or node positive rectal cancer will get radiation therapy either preoperative or postoperative. And then again, depending on what their pathologic staging was and what their clinical staging was, that determines whether or not they need additional adjuvant chemotherapy, just like we would in colon cancer. So this talks a little bit about why we oftentimes will do preoperative therapy. And this is the German rectal cancer study. Um, and this is an, an old study nowadays, but we still go back to this data. Um, these took people, again, with a locally advanced rectal cancer um, who were thought to benefit from radiation therapy. And rather than waiting until after surgery, moved it up to prior to surgery to see if there was any difference. So an interesting thing that came out of this, which um, is, is somewhat controversial, but when you sent the patient at randomization to the surgeon to say, are they going to need an APR? You know, is it a low-lying rectal tumor where you're going to need to remove the anal sphincter with that surgery, and that per person will have a permanent colostomy? Or can you get away with what we call a low anterior resection, which is where you cut out the tumor and you have enough rectum left behind that you can do a primary anastomosis. Um, so in the preoperative group and postoperative group, um, about 28% and 20% respectively were thought to need an APR. They thought the tumor was too low lying, they weren't going to be able to spare their sphincter, and were probably going to need to have a permanent colostomy. Those who got preoperative chemo radiation, at the end of the day, when you look at the actual numbers, um, sphincter preserving surgery was performed in 45 of those 116 patients. So patients who, who originally went to see their surgeon who said, if I operate now, you would probably need an APR and a permanent colostomy, were able to get away with not having that and instead having an LAR with, a, with an anastomosis. And then, of course, those who got post-operative chemo radiation, well, those are the people who did go to surgery and had the surgery that their surgeon thought they needed initially. So one of the benefits that's often quoted to patients for preoperative therapy, especially for low-lying tumors, it doesn't so much matter for upper rectal cancers because they're probably going to have an LAR anyway. But for someone with a real low-lying tumor, sometimes um, there may be a role for chemo radiation to allow them to have a, sph a sphincter-sparing surgery. In addition, the toxic side effects of chemo radiation after surgery are greater than they are before. People tolerate chemo radiation much better before surgery. 
um, both in terms of diarrhea, in terms of their GI side effects, um, strictures, bladder problems, and other toxicities. So people tolerate treatment better and probably has a little bit better outcome. So we tend, for those people who we think are going to need radiation at some point, tend to do it pre-op rather than post-op. You don't lose much. There's no benefit in terms of survival. So if you stage somebody a little earlier than you think, you think they have a T2 tumor, and they go to surgery, and lo and behold, they're actually T3N1, you don't lose much in terms of survival. You don't, you don't miss that chance to cure them by giving them post-op therapy. It's just not as well tolerated. So again, colon cancer is staged pathologically at the time of surgery. Surgery is generally their first treatment. Rectal cancer, on the other hand, is staged clinically and radiographically, and then they go on to have surgery. And the reason that that's important is because when you see a pathology report from a rectal cancer patient, you should ask, did they receive pre-op therapy? Because more often than not, that pre-op therapy will downstage their tumor. So someone who you thought was a T3N1 based on their imaging or their ultrasound may be a T1N0 at the time of surgery. Um, so it's really important to ask, did they have pre-op therapy? Because that really helps determine whether or not you give them additional adjuvant chemotherapy. If there's somebody you really thought had stage 3 disease when they presented, they probably need that additional full FOX chemotherapy that we would do for colon cancer. Um, however, if it's somebody who went straight to surgery and truly had a T1 or T2 N0 tumor, they probably don't need additional adjuvant therapy. So colon and rectal cancer, we treat very similarly, and you, he you he'll hear colorectal cancer, but in, in reality, when you see someone who's had surgery for rectal cancer, you really need to ask, did they receive preoperative therapy? In terms of survivorship, um, surveillance, we've become a little bit more, I guess, active surveillors than we used to be. Um, guidelines would suggest they need a CEA and then a quote-unquote periodic, maybe annual CT, depending upon their stage and risk of recurrence. Because we've realized that there are a small population of patients who present with oligometastatic disease um, with a metachronous recurrence, meaning their recurrence or their metastatic disease occurs after they've had their surgery with curative intent, there are a small proportion of those people who you might still be able to cure um, if you catch them at a time when they have oligometastatic disease. And so we, we tend to be a little bit more aggressive, if you will, in terms of state restaging people with scans every three to four months, as opposed to waiting for them to present with their symptomatic recurrence at a point where their disease at that point clearly would not be resectable. Um, they have a colonoscopy one year from their surgery, and then three years later, and then five years later. If at any point in that time they're found to have another adenomatous polyp, generally greater than a centimeter, they should have another colonoscopy the next year. So anybody who has had a diagnosis of colon cancer, regardless of family history, regardless of genetics, um, is going to be at higher risk of getting a second colon cancer, purely by the fact that they had one colon cancer. And it's probably because something environmental or genetic predisposed them to that first colon cancer, so they probably have a higher risk of getting a second than the general population. Um, so they should never go more than five years. That's different than the recommendations for the general public, which is every 10 years. Um, but somebody who has had colon cancer should never go more than five years. What are the long-term effects of treatment? Oxaliplatin-induced peripheral neuropathy, and that, that is a real problem um, that we try to be very proactive about in terms of dose reductions and monitoring people, um, but it's not that uncommon to have some residual peripheral neuropathy at the completion of chemotherapy. Increased dual frequency and complete evacuation, that's in part related to the radiation and the surgery, and then sexual dysfunction as well. A little bit about metastatic colorectal cancer now, and, and I think that this is important because it's, it's an evolving field. So another case, this is, you know, back in 2009, a lady presents with bright red blood per rectum. She has a four-centimeter ulcerated mass in the colon. Um, CT, abdomen, pelvis, and a chest X-ray were negative for metastatic disease. She had her hemicolectomy. Um, she had basically a, a T3N0 tumor, chose not to get additional chemotherapy. Again, she had a stage 2 tumor and made the decision not to pursue additional therapy. And then about a year, a little over a year later, um, came back for a follow-up visit and had a CEA of 166. A CEA over 100 should always raise some big red flags um, for the presence of metastatic disease. Colonoscopy revealed no evidence of a local recurrence, but unfortunately a CT of her chest, abdomen, and pelvis revealed three new liver lesions, all in the right hepatic lobe. So when you talk about somebody with metastatic colon cancer and how we treat metastatic colon cancer, 
Um, again, the first question you should ask in somebody with metastatic disease is, is their disease potentially resectable? Can you, can you encompass all of their metastatic disease in, in a surgeon's knife, basically, or a radiation field for that matter? Um, and that really does dictate a little bit how we treat people. We tend to start with chemotherapy in these situations, especially in somebody with newly diagnosed metastatic disease, um, because you sort of assume that if they have disease you can see, there's probably disease that you can't see, right? So we start with chemotherapy, and the most commonly used are Fulfox and Fulfiri, which is 5-FU, again, with either oxaliplatin or iranotecan. Oxaliplatin causes neuropathy. Iranotecan causes diarrhea. The, otherwise, they're very similarly tolerated. You can use one or the other. What matters the most is that at some point in their course of treatment, if you're treating them with the intent of just palliation, prolonging their life, the sequence is not as important as the fact that they get all the drugs. So as long as they're exposed to all of these drugs at some point in time, it doesn't matter the order. So we oftentimes will pick the regimen based on the patient and their the side effect profile and their comorbidities. If it's somebody who just finished their adjuvant full fox chemotherapy three months ago, well, it doesn't make sense to go back to the full fox. Or if it's a diabetic with severe peripheral neuropathy, it might be a little bit safer to go with full theory to start with. You'll hear about antiangiogenic therapy in metastatic colon cancer, bevacizumab being the flagship. There are now an additional three antiangiogenic agents that inhibit the vascular endothelial growth factor in various ways that have been approved in colon cancer. Um, they, no one really knows, uh, is one better than the other. Interestingly, they all appear to be very similar in terms of how long they prolong people's lives. Uh, but, but bevacizumab was the first and is probably still the most commonly used because of people's comfort with it. Um, again, it's an anti-angiogenic. It's a monoclonal antibody against VEGF, which is overproduced by tumors. The biggest risk, people don't really even know they're getting it most of the time. You can get some asymptomatic proteinuria. I've never had a case where it's nephrotic range proteinuria, but we do monitor their urinalysis for protein and occasionally send off a 24-hour urine for protein. Infusional reactions are actually rare. It will cause hypertension, and that's actually a good thing in the sense that there are some studies suggesting that those patients who have hypertension actually have better uh, response rates. There is a very small but real risk of GI perforation, um, and that's important to know when you have a patient with metastatic colon cancer who has pain related to their cancer, but all of a sudden calls with, with acute worsening of their pain. Rather than just increasing their pain medications, you should really do diligence would, would be making sure that something more catastrophic hasn't happened. And again, because it's an anti-angiogenic, you're going to increase the risk of um, both venous and arterial thromboembolic disease. Anti-angiogenic agents, and this, this stands for all of them, delay wound healing. So elective surgeries would preferably be delayed until you can allow for at least a four- to six-week washout period. So this woman had uh, full fox and bevacizumab for four cycles, eight weeks of treatment, and it showed that there were no new lesions showing up. She had a decrease in size of her four hepatic lesions. She got a little bit more chemotherapy as she was tolerating it well and seemed to have a nice response and then went on to have a partial hepatectomy, and after that was then followed. So the important takeaway point is that um, when you look at colorectal cancer all comers, about 20%, one in five, will have metastatic disease at the time of presentation. So long-term survival, you know, when you look at metastatic colon cancer, um, how, how long is how long is long, right? And, and how many people live that long? About 10 to 20 percent of people are still alive five years out from their diagnosis, and this is a diagnosis with an incurable cancer. So that's important to know. That 20 percent includes patients like this who maybe present with potentially curable um, metastatic disease. There are also those who clearly have unresectable metastatic disease, diffuse lung and liver involvement. And even in that population, you'll have about 10% or so who are still alive five years out. So the, the chemotherapy for colon cancer works and is generally well tolerated and can meaningfully improve people's um, lives. So again, always, always, always consider um, metastasectomy for those people with oligometastatic disease. And you really need to get them involved uh, with a surgical oncologist from day one to come up with a plan. And so I say that again, not, not that you should know who's resectable and who's not, but just realize that if it's somebody just because they're diagnosed with stage four disease doesn't mean it's all downhill from there. There are those select few who really do need to be referred for more aggressive therapy.
So this is survival in metastatic colon cancer, just to give you a picture. Um, so in the 50s, median survival was about six months. We had very little to offer those patients. For a long time, all we had was 5-fluorouracil, which in and of itself doubles median survival from about six months to a year. And then you can see this rash of drugs approved in metastatic colon cancer starting in the late 1990s. Um, even in the past few years of Flibercept, Regorafenib, Ramucirumab, all of which are anti-angiogenic agents to some degree, um, have all been improved. And you can see that the median survival, all comers, average patient diagnosed with metastatic colon cancer now lives about two and a half years. Um, without chemotherapy, that's still about six months. And so, it, it, again, it really does it, it meaningfully improve how long people live. And most people can have some decent um, quality of life years in that, too. Briefly, EGFR inhibitors, epidermal growth factor inhibitors, or monoclonal antibodies, um, cetuximab and panitumumab are the two approved for use in metastatic colon cancer. There is some activity if you use them by yourselves in terms of stabilizing disease, slowing progression, but they're usually used in combination with chemotherapy. Um, people will get an acneiform rash, and it can be mild or it can be very severe. Um, hypersensitivity reactions are real. It's about 3% of having a true hypersensitivity reaction, um, and in some cases even anaphylaxis. That incidence is much higher in the Bible Belt, so in parts of Tennessee and North Carolina, that can be as high as 20%, one out of five, and it's probably something environmental that, it, that predisposes them. And then electrolyte abnormalities, in particular low magnesium levels. Who do you use EGFR inhibitors on? And that comes down to the RAS gene. So interestingly, for a long time, we thought maybe, you know, if your tumor overexpresses EGFR, that would make sense that an EGFR inhibitor would work. Well, that was the wrong thing to look at because it didn't really correlate. Um, but if you look at the schematic downstream of the EGFR, of the epidermal growth factor receptor, um, you'll see the KRAS um, and the RAS pathway. And actually, we find that mutations in that pathway um, those patients do not benefit from EGFR inhibitors. And you can see why. If you have a pathway that's constitutively turned down downstream, it doesn't matter what you do to those receptors upstream. So patients who have RAS mutations, and it used to be KRAS, now we also include NRAS, sort of pan-RAS we call it, patients with activating mutations in RAS really do not benefit from EGFR inhibitors and should not receive them, and they may actually even do a little bit worse. So just a couple quick pearls so you all know that an unexplained iron deficiency needs a, a true endoscopy GI workup, not just stool cards. Um, Streptococcus bovis, clostridium sepsis should trigger a colonoscopy um, once the acute episode resolves. So you all know that, but again, it just doesn't hurt to say it again. Okay, I'm going to switch gears and talk about anal cancer. So goes without saying, anal cancer is different than rectal cancer. I think uh, sometimes it's a little hard. What's anal cancer? What's rectal cancer? How are they different? We treat them both with chemo radiation. Sometimes they're very different cancers um, with very different treatment implications. So anal cancers are primarily squamous cell histology. Very rarely will you see an anal adenocarcinoma or a rectal squamous cell carcinoma. It happens, um, but but very rarely. So usually, anal cancers are squamous cell carcinomas. Um, they are treated with chemoradiation, not really in a pre-op fashion, but with the intent of curing them. And that actually came about, um, all of these patients used to go to surgery, have an APR, have a permanent colostomy, and then someone along the way kind of said, well, what if we did chemoradiation and tried to downstage them, and, and maybe we could preserve some, some of these people's sphincters. And lo and behold, when they took those people to the operating room, they had no viable tumor left. And so um, ever since that point, chemotherapy and radiation has really been the standard treatment for anal cancers. We really reserve surgery only for those patients who still have persistent disease months later. Um, again, you have to wait at least 8 to 12 weeks after the completion of therapy. If you biopsy or do scans any earlier than three months after they finish their chemotherapy and radiation, you may very well have residual disease that if you just watch and wait will will go away on its own over the next 6 to 12 weeks. So most surgeons would say they would never take someone for an APR because of recurrent or residual disease after four weeks. You really need to wait at least three months before you reevaluate for any evidence of residual disease. Um, and then metastatic disease, the drugs, the really, on, really the only drugs that have been ever studied, and, and, and even that study is, is very limited, is cisplatin and 5-FU. So you can extrapolate from other squamous cell cancers from other sites and use some of those agents, which we do. Um, 
But the reality is most people will present with curable disease. Um, most patients, almost I would say the vast majority of patients that I see with anal cancer, present with a quote-unquote non-healing hemorrhoid, a hemorrhoid that, was, that just kept bleeding and became painful. And so they eventually made their way to a colorectal surgeon, a surgeon who excised it, and lo and behold, it was a squamous cell cancer. Um, so again, you know, I'm the, I'm the person who sees the 1% of patients with hemorrhoids that are actually anal cancer, whereas 99% of them are hemorrhoids. But it just goes to show the red flags, you know, things that are easily attributed to more benign conditions when they're not getting better with symptomatic or supportive treatment, you should always sort of raise a red flag as to what else is going on. Okay, esophageal cancer. So we're going to go through uh, all the rest of these a little bit more quickly than we did colon cancer. Um, esophageal cancers used to be primarily squamous. Um, nowadays, they're more adeno than squamous. For adenocarcinoma, obesity, reflux disease, and Barrett's esophagus are the primary risk factors. Um, squamous cancers, tobacco, and alcohol. And you can see why. Obesity is on the rise. Tobacco, we're actually doing a little bit better job about um, smoking cessation. And so the histology of esophageal cancers is changing. Um, Barrett's with high-grade dysplasia has a very high risk of cancer in, in a year, and, and a high-grade dysplasia lesion, most people would need, would say needs surgical resection. There is some data out there now that you can probably do these endoscopic mucosal resections as well, but in any event, Barrett's with high-grade dysplasia is not something to ignore. So for someone with a potentially resectable esophageal cancer, um, surgery and radiation are local therapies, and when you add one to the other, you improve their local control. So if somebody has a kind of locally advanced node-positive esophagus cancer, um, again, a, a, a more advanced esophagus cancer, a lot of times we will do preoperative chemoradiation followed by surgery. Um, adjuvant is hard to tolerate, and esophagectomy is still a big, morbid procedure, and it's difficult for people to tolerate any adjuvant therapy after that. So most of the time it's done pre-op, um, and again, improves local control. The hard part is that esophageal cancers have a very rich lymphatic plexus um, in the submucosa, so very superficial, rich lymphatic plexus, and cancers of the esophagus metastasize very, very early. So even people with very early-stage cancers have a very high risk of having metastatic disease down the road. Um, so because of that, no matter what you do to that local tumor, we can control the primary esophagus cancer pretty well with surgery and radiation. The problem really is that these patients are at such high risk of dying of metastatic disease down the road um, that it's been difficult to show a real improvement in survival by adding radiation therapy and or surgery. For squamous cell cancers, they tend to be very radiation sensitive, so doing chemotherapy and radiation with the intent of curing them, um, only saving surgery for those with residual diseases, reasonable approach, it's somewhat controversial, but not... Um, but not out of the realm of possibility. And again, there's really, unlike colon cancer, where we spend five or ten minutes going through the role of adjuvant therapy, there's really no good data regarding adjuvant chemotherapy and esophagus cancer. So gastric cancer is so the black line, and I realize you probably can't read this there, but the black line that you see um, is basically the age-adjusted cancer death rates. And you can see, and this is males on the left and females on the right, and you can see they're heading down significantly over the years, which is great. And you'd, you'd like to think it's because of modern medicine, when, it, when in reality it's because of probably refrigeration, right? People smoked their food, um, which introduces a lot of carcinogens. And, and with the era of refrigeration, we, see, we have seen a drastic decline in the incidence of gastric cancer, which is wonderful. That's still not the case so much in, in the... Uh, developing world where gastric cancer rates are still very high. So for potentially curable disease with gastric cancer, there are really two approaches. You can go straight to surgery, particularly for patients who have very bulky disease, who are losing weight, who are not doing well, who maybe have even partially obstructing disease. Um, you can do the gastrectomy and then follow that up with chemoradiation. And that has basically been shown to um, you probably cure a small percentage of people compared to surgery alone. Um, for somebody who's fit, who's in good shape, um, you can use combination chemotherapy somewhat perioperatively. We give a few cycles before surgery, 
and then a few cycles after surgery, again, realizing that a gastrectomy is a huge surgery and not everyone will receive that post-op therapy, which is why sometimes it makes sense to try to get some of that treatment in ahead of time if you can, so at least they have some, some systemic therapy. So again, both of those approaches um, have been shown to improve survival and cure rates compared with surgery alone. So either one is reasonable. It depends very much on the surgeon and on the patient and, and how they're doing um, as to which you choose. What about metastatic disease? Um, so t nowadays, uh, the average person with a metastatic gastroesophageal cancer um, without treatment, um, with just best supportive care, would live probably on the average six months. We probably about double that with chemotherapy, somewhere around a year. Um, those with cancers overexpressing her too new um, probably really do benefit from the addition of trastuzumab, and you can see in these survival curves again, on the y-axis, you see the survival probability um, and then time. And you can see that the red line is those who received chemotherapy plus trastuzumab, and the blue line is chemotherapy alone. And so anybody with a gastroesophageal cancer, especially of the GE junction or the stomach, um, really should have their tumor tested for her too new. Um, otherwise, like I said, it's traditional cytotoxic chemotherapy, which, which can prolong people's lives. Okay, so liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, hepatitis B and C account for the majority of cases. Um, kind of a, a quick pearl, um, hepatitis B is a DNA virus. Hepatitis C is uh, an RNA virus. Um, but really, honestly, cirrhosis of any type is a risk factor. So those with cirrhosis really should be undergoing screening. So this is a 65-year-old lady with chronic hepatitis C who presents with some right upper quadrant pain. You can see kind of the, the arrow sign, so to speak, here, pointing to this uh, obviously abnormal mass, and her AFP is 12. So this we, we use this as oncologists occasionally in deciding whether or not to biopsy something. And this is a question I get all the time when we're on the wards is, do they need to have this biopsied? This is probably an HCC. Does it need to be biopsied? And we kind of go to the liver literature. Right, so by the time I see patients, most of the oncology literature focuses on those with known disease. The question is, how do we determine who needs a biopsy and who doesn't? So you have to realize that these guidelines were made for hepatologists who are following patients with cirrhosis and screening them. This is not made to work up a liver mass that was diagnosed because someone was symptomatic and came into the ER. So you have to realize how these guidelines were were made in the first place, but nevertheless, you know, if you have a liver nodule greater than a centimeter, okay, so that's most patients who are going to present, you know, symptomatically, you can do a four phase or what we call a triple phase here, CT, um, or a contrast enhanced MRI. So either or. And if you have the traditional features of an HCC and you really need a radiologist who's comfortable making that call, you can make the diagnosis off of imaging. You don't need a biopsy in all of these folks. If the CT is not necessarily diagnostic, you can do the MRI or vice versa. Again, if you have a radiologist who's willing to say, yes, this has classic features of HCC, the clinical picture fits, somebody has cirrhosis, you don't need to biopsy those people. The exception to that is somebody without cirrhosis. Somebody without cirrhosis shouldn't really um, have an HCC. Now, there are exceptions to that, obviously. Um, but again, these guidelines only apply to somebody with cirrhosis in my mind. So if you have a patient without cirrhosis who comes in with a liver mass and you're trying to decide whether it needs to be biopsied, it needs to be biopsied. Um, and somebody with cirrhosis who has a, either a triple phase CT or an MRI, which is diagnostic of HCC in the right clinical scenario, you don't necessarily need to biopsy. You will notice that AFP, serum AFP, is nowhere in these guidelines. So it doesn't matter to me if their AFP is 2,000 or if their AFP is 2. That does not in and of itself help me with the diagnosis of HCC. It's helpful to follow during treatment, um, but just because their AFP is 200 doesn't mean it's a HCC. It could be a metastatic germ cell tumor, for example. So the AFP in and of itself is not diagnostic. and doesn't really help me one way or the other other than to follow patients during treatment. So again, they're often not hypermetabolic on a PET CT. So if you do a PET CT and it doesn't show uptake in this liver lesion, it's not because it's not malignant. Um, HCC typically does not um, concentrate FDG. Remember that AFP can be elevated in a number of other conditions, um, both benign and malignant. But again, you don't ever want to miss a curable cancer like testicular cancer, for example, metastatic to the liver. 
Um, there's a, a variant of HCC called the fibrolamellar variant. So these actually have a much better prognosis than the typical HCC. These happen in younger patients, often without cirrhosis. And we treat them fairly aggressively. Even those who present with metastatic disease, we're a little bit more aggressive about even resecting metastases. And they, unlike a traditional HCC, are sensitive to some traditional cytotoxic chemotherapy regimens. Treatment requires a multidisciplinary approach. So ideally, a surgical resection, but you have to have really good liver function to be able to tolerate a surgical resection. So child PUA may be a good B. Um, the Milan criteria for transplant, and again, that's really just if they have inadequate reserve for surgical resection, has to be a single tumor less than five centimeters or up to three tumors less than three centimeters. Those are not hard and fast rules and depend very much on this transplant team and on the surgeon. So someone who's close um, definitely um, should have a surgical or transplant eval. And then you can do local therapy. So there's ablation, radiofrequency ablation, alcohol ablation, cryoablation, you can kind of pick your poison in that regard, which is really best for a small, limited number of lesions because you have to introduce the catheter into each one of those lesions. So if you have 10, that's not really going to be all that practical. Also, the size cutoff is about 3 centimeters. Anything greater than 3 centimeters, you're just not really going to get um, adequate control of that with a, with a local therapy like an ablation. And then there's embolization. So you have bland embolization, you have chemoembolization, which we call TACE, and then you have yttrium-90 or radioembolization. Um, and again, that's, you, you again, and I think I have a slide here, you, you, you have to really kind of think about the blood supply to the liver. And the liver, again, has dual blood supply from the portal vein and the hepatic artery. HCCs preferentially get their blood supply from the hepatic artery. Fortunately, the normal um, liver traditionally gets its blood supply from the portal vein. So you can embolize the hepatic artery and somewhat preferentially embolize those blood vessels that supply the tumor, which is why chemoembolization, radioembolization, bland embolization work. Um, again, the contraindications, if you have a portal vein occlusion, your normal liver is getting its blood supply from the hepatic artery, and you embolize that, you're in trouble. Um, hepatofugal flow, pulmonary shunts, um, somebody already with a bilirubin greater than three who has not such great liver reserve to begin with. Um, unfortunately, that's not that sort of hepatic artery portal vein thing is not perfect, so there is some crossover. And somebody who has a bilirubin of six probably doesn't have a liver in the greatest shape, and, and the, their normal liver may not tolerate a chemoembolization, and, and you can actually precipitate acute hepatic failure. Um, very briefly, this is metastatic um, HCC. There have been, I can't even count how many studies um, in metastatic or locally advanced unresectable HCC, um, and the only approved drug at this point is serafinib. So serafinib or Nexavar is the brand name. It's a pill um, that patients take, um, again, an anti-angiogenic agent. And you can see that it does improve overall survival. The serafinib is that black line on top uh, relative to placebo. The important thing is that responses in terms of does the tumor shrink are few and far between. It's mostly disease stability. So there's no rush or urgency to start somebody on serafinib because you're worried that they have such bulky disease that maybe serafinib will will induce this response and make them better. It doesn't. It, it purely stabilizes things and slows progression of the disease. So responses, you don't expect it to really shrink. Those are few and far between. And, and that's important when you counsel patients so that they don't aren't let down in three months when their scans haven't really changed much. And then I think the last cancer we're going to go through quickly is pancreatic cancer. So again, this is a case of a 59-year-old lady who presented with epigastric pain and nausea. Um, unrelieved with a proton pump inhibitor. Um, her primary care provider very appropriately ordered a CT of the abdomen, and you can see this sort of amorphous mass um, basically encasing the SMA. So new diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, no obvious evidence of distant disease, who's resectable and who's not. And, and my own feeling is that all of these patients should, should see a surgical oncologist or a hepatobiliary surgeon to determine whether or not they're resectable. There are criteria, and, and these criteria, again, are not hard and fast and depend on the patient and on the surgeon, but for the most part, in order to be truly resectable up front, you have to have a patent portal vein, a patent SMV, and there's got to be a good fat plane between the tumor and the SMA and the celiac arteries. So those who are unresectable encase the SMA or the celiac artery. You have um, portal vein or SMV encasement greater than 180 degrees. And then there's this sort of borderline um, group where maybe they don't quite fit 
criteria for either resectable or unresectable, and those are the patients who usually are referred for preoperative therapy, and at that point then restage to determine whether or not they're resectable. So risk factors, pancreatitis, diabetes, smoking, none of those have the greatest evidence but have kind of consistently shown up as possible risk factors. Um, Again, 95% of pancreatic cancers have a mutated activating um, mutation in KRAS. There's really no role for screening. CA199 is, seems very attractive screening method, but the problem with CA199, of course, is that it's very not specific. Um, it can be helpful in following disease, but not so much in diagnosis. And again, the classic presentation, if you have a lesion in the head of the pancreas, is painless jaundice. I always tell the fellows there's a 20% rule. So when patients diagnosed with pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and again, I should specify that this is adenocarcinoma, 20% um, of patients will be receptible, which means 80%, unfortunately, by the time that they present with symptoms are already unresectable or metastatic. And then 20% of those, 20% of the 20% who are resected will be long-term survivors. So we have a ways to go in pancreatic cancer. Um, unfortunately, 95% uh, of people will ultimately succumb to their disease. So there's no data that pre-op treatment improves survival in those borderline resectable patients, um, but it's often done. And there is also no strong data to support adjuvant radiation therapy. Um, again, because many people who have recurrent disease, it's with metastatic disease. It's not in the pancreatic bed. Although that happens, it's not the most common presentation. Standard of care is adjuvant gemcitabine. So for someone who has had a resected pancreatic cancer who has undergone a Whipple resection, positive margins or not, and, and in fact anybody who has had a resected pancreatic cancer um, should be referred for adjuvant therapy, and that can include a margin-negative T1 N0 tumor. Um, this is a study that looked at just observation after surgery versus adjuvant gemcitabine, and you can see that the gemcitabine curve is on top, meaning they have better survival, more people are alive. Um, somewhere around a little less than 20% of people who received adjuvant gemcitabine were alive five years later. When you look at the observation arm, you see that that number is closer to about 5 to 10%. So gemcitabine improves people's survival really because it probably does cure a very small percentage of people, but you can see survival is still abysmal, and these are in patients who actually had resectable disease at presentation. Still, only about 20% of those were alive. There are studies now... Um, extrapolating from the metastatic literature, looking at more aggressive chemotherapy regimens like fulfirinox, which we'll talk about just very briefly, those studies are still ongoing to determine whether that is better than gemcitabine. So uh, again, for a long time in metastatic pancreatic cancer, we had very little other than gemcitabine, um, and it was really the standard of care, although again, responses were few and far between. It was mostly um, disease stability, and actually, it's it's rare in oncology to have a drug approved if it doesn't improve survival, which gemcitabine does not. Whether you do best supportive care or single agent gemcitabine, the median survival is about six months. It doesn't really improve on that, but it helped with clinical benefit. There was about 20% uh, or so of patients who actually gained weight when they were on gemcitabine, who felt better, had more energy, less pain, and so therefore, for the quote unquote clinical benefit, gemcitabine became the standard of care. Fulfirinox, this was presented at a, a, a meeting about four years ago and has now become the standard of care for um, patients with a good performance status who are young and healthy. Um, it's a combination of 5-fluorouracil, oxaliplatin, and irinotecan. And when you compare that to gemcitabine, the response rate, meaning how many people have their tumors actually shrink by 30% or more, um, goes from about 10% with gemcitabine, and those numbers are actually flipped. I see now that I'm looking at this. Um, should be 10% for gemcitabine and about 31% for fulfirinox. So you can see that um, people respond better. And, and, of course, it is a more toxic regimen, however. You have three different drugs as opposed to one. So, it, again, we really reserve that for patients who, are, um, who have a good performance status and otherwise healthy. And it almost not quite doubles how long people live. So the survival has gone from six months to somewhere closer to a year with fulfirinox. And again, these, this regimen is now being looked in the adjuvant setting in those patients who have had surgery. Um, could this potentially um, help decrease the risk of recurrence? And then lastly, GI neuroendocrine tumors. Um, suffice it to say, this is a very heterogeneous group of cancers and not something that I would expect um, you would ever need to know, especially for medicine boards, but they can range from something very indolent, like a carcinoid, to a very poorly differentiated high-grade neuroendocrine tumor. 
So the treatment of choice for low-grade tumors is surgery. Even those with limited metastatic disease, um, you try to treat their disease locally. The reason being is that cytotoxic chemotherapy has never really worked. They're very low-grade tumors. They tend not to respond to chemotherapy. There may be a role for somatostatin analogs, octreotide, for example, in delaying progression of disease. We think about it in treating the carcinoid symptoms, the secretion syndromes, uh, but there is probably a role in those well-differentiated tumors in using octreotide to help delay progression of disease for those with unresectable disease. The high-grade tumors are bad actors. Um, they're very much like a small cell lung cancer, right? So we treat them very much like a small cell lung cancer, platinum, etoposide. The metastatic potential is very high. So even if they present with limited disease, um, their risk of having metastatic disease within the next 6 to 12 months is very high, um, and prognosis is generally not great. And the one point I want to make out of this slide is that um, this, again, is looking at somatostatin analogs, so well-differentiated enteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, again, we think of using somatostatin analogs for, for symptoms, right, the secretion um, syndrome. But in, in reality, there's probably some evidence and probably some suggestion that it decreases the progression of disease, slows the disease down. But what you need to look at in this slide is these are patients who have low-grade Gastro gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors who are started on placebo or lanreotide, which is a somatostatin analog. And then they're followed in terms of when do they progress. And what I want to point out is that even those in the placebo arm who were doing nothing other than injecting placebo and coming for scans periodically, you can see that 50% of people, it took 18 months for them to progress with placebo. So these are very indolent cancers that you can safely sometimes watch. There is clearly activity of somatostatin analogs, and lanreotide is not the only one. Octreotide, there is a similar study that has shown similar results. Um, so they can certainly delay progression of disease, but they're expensive drugs, and the question is if you can control someone's disease with placebo for 12 to 18 months, at what point do you add this drug? And, and that's still really an, an area of, of research at this point. So in conclusion, I, again, you know, 1 in 20 people will be diagnosed with colon cancer. So no matter what specialty or subspecialty you're going to, you will take care of colon cancer patients. And I think the most important thing to realize is how to counsel those patients who are in your office when they come to you and say, yeah, the oncologist recommended chemo, should I or should I not? Um, it's just important to, to recognize when is treatment palliative and when could it be potentially curative, because that makes a big difference in terms of counseling patients. Um, even with palliative treatment, recognize that there is probably about 10 to 20 percent of patients with metastatic disease who will still be alive and doing fairly well five years later. Um, so even those with, with stage 4 disease um, who are undergoing palliative treatment can still live for a long time and do well. And then lastly, recognize the red flags. Most GI cancers present with symptoms that you can easily chalk up to something else, the esophageal cancer that presents with heartburn, the anal cancer that presents with hemorrhoids. And, and again, I'm, I'm biased because I'm the one who sees that 0.1% of heartburn that actually is a GE junction cancer or the hemorrhoid that's actually an anal cancer. I don't see that other 99.9%. Um, but just recognize that when you, when you treat those other conditions, as you should, um, with you know, symptomatic treatment, when things aren't getting better, that's the time to refer them for, for further workup. And that's it. Thank you.